We pray that you'd be with us today, that you would give us your word. You give us the message, Lord. Help me to be able to express it appropriately, Lord. Uh, less of me and more of you. We pray and thank you first and foremost, Father, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We're so thankful, Jesus, that you came as a Lamb of God. You gave your blood and your body. You who knew no sin, you became our sin. And then you went to the cross. What a blessing, Lord. You went to the cross. You took the wrath upon yourself, gave your blood and your body. And then you rose from the dead and walked out of that grave on the third day, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives and making us born again children of the living God. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So the reason we're here, I was talking, Eric was talking to me about um, our, what is the, um, would you say, the, for First Love Ministries USA, what's our, our mission statement, right? Okay, what's your mission statement? All right, so the mission statement for First Love Ministries USA is the mission statement for this group, okay? It's been the mission statement from the beginning. Um, and it, it all it evolves around what I just prayed, okay? That everything about the name, we came up with the name First Love Ministries USA because we wanted everything to be focused. First love, everything we do is on Jesus Christ. So we would never have a ministry that got distracted some way, some other way from being focused on Jesus Christ and where you're going to be in 10,000 years. That's it. And, and in, to do that, we always prayed. Remember the prayer we have, our, our, our passage is, um, see, Psalm 19, 14. I can remember, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, there's a lot packed in that passage. My rock and my redeemer. Well, who's the rock? Jesus Christ. We build our house. We build our ministry on what? On the rock. Okay, when the storms come, storms are coming. We have the year end giving. We have some great needs at the year end here. Okay, we got to catch up. Okay, and I mentioned the number, how much we need to catch up to one of the guys. He said, Whoa, that's low money. I said, No, it's not a lot of money because all the people that are out there are very capable of doing what needs to be done. So, what do we do now? What do we do? We let the thinking, what do I, how do I do with my thinking? What do I do with my thinking? Because today we're going to talk about what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay. And, all, and what that does, and when you're a Christian, now think of it this way, and I'm going to cut through a whole lot of uh, theology here, but I want to make it as clear as I can. Before you're a Christian, before you come to Christ, before the Holy Spirit comes into you, the Spirit of Christ, you are a slave to sin. And what that means is it, it, you can't necessarily see it on the outside, somebody looking at somebody, although you can, you know, when people are out of control. But what, you, what it means is that you always, now listen carefully, you always will do <clears throat> what you think is in your own best interest. You think about yourself all the time. You can't help but do it because you, you have the spirit of the flesh controls you. And what that means is what you think and what you feel, okay, controls what you're going to think and what you're going to feel and what you're going to do. But when you're a Christian, now listen, when you become born again, that's why the word Jesus said, you cannot be of God or a child of God without being born again. And what that means is that on the inside of you is the spirit of the living God. And that spirit, as it comes into you now, frees you from the slavery to sin. So what that means is now you have a choice. I want you to hear this. You're not, it's not like God comes in and makes you a robot. A lot of people, I've had people come to my house and beg me. And they begged me to pray that God would make them a, a robot, a, a, G, a Jesus robot, a Christian robot. That God would take over all the decisions and that God would just make them just do these things that are right. And they wanted to disengage. They wanted to commit suicide on the inside. Okay. And God says, that's not how it works. It's all about, all about you and I trusting God. In other words, do we actually believe what the word of God says? Do we actually trust God for what he's saying? In other words, are we as men of God, are we trusting God? That means, can we change the way we think? And the answer is yes, because God, the Holy Spirit will help us if, now here it is, this is a biggie, because Christians have a tendency, you know, lambs, they fall off, you know, the turn up truck or whatever, they get out of whack. And what God says is, how a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. 
So what God wants us to do is he wants us to focus on the word of God because the word of God, as Psalm 119 tells us, the entire Psalm, the word of God is how we keep our minds focused and how we move forward so that we can be what? We can be one with Christ. We can walk with Christ. We can follow Christ. We can turn away from the evil one. And we can do the things we need to do. Because remember, the whole premise of this, I want to say it again, and, and Paul talks about it in, in uh, Romans, it's that we are no longer slaves to sin. That doesn't mean we don't have the ability to sin. doesn't mean that we don't have the flesh in there trying to sell us on sinning. It means that we now, if we want to, if in the desire of our heart, we decide that we want to follow Christ and walk with him, the power of the Holy Spirit is there. It's like people who drink too much. So they come in, they're Christians, they drink too much, and we say to them, you know, you can, you can not drink. And they say, well, I really want to drink, or I, I really, I'm going to drink, or whatever that is. I said, yes, but as a Christian, if you truly have Christ, unless you don't, but if you do have Christ, then you can ask him and you can pray and you can read your word and you can do these things at the time when you normally have your first wife, you know, glass of wine or whatever. But they don't want to do that. You see, they don't want to read their Bible at that time of the day. They don't want to have a time of prayer at that time of the day. Do you know why? Because they don't, because they want to have the wine and they don't want to have Christ. You see what I'm saying? It's when a man has a trouble because he's looking at the girls, right? He's married, he has a beautiful wife, but he just can't keep his eyes off the girls. And the answer is, don't go places. Don't be, in, 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 don't be alone with women. Don't do anything where you're in a position to do that. And then you pray and you read your Bible and you memorize your passages. You memorize the passages in the Bible that tell you that that is death and that will destroy you. The same thing in your business, the same thing in all the things that you are trying to do and accomplish. You have to think about how you think. And the place where that talks about it really well is the area where it talks about anxiety and it talks about prayer and it talks about the peace of God, which, hey, I don't want anxiety. I want to be able to pray and God to hear me and answer my prayers. I want to thank God. And I, I just want to have, you know, peace in my mind, peace of mind. What's it say the next thing in Philippians chapter four, right after four through seven, what's it say? The next passages like uh, eight, nine and 10, it talks about, that you and I are to what? To think about those things that are excellent, praiseworthy, right? Those things that God gives you to think about. And if you think about those things all the time, in other words, you, you force yourself, you, you, um, you go out and you discipline yourself. We don't like that word, do we? You discipline yourself to go out and to do and to think the things that God tells you to think that are, that are really nice. They're wonderful. They're praiseworthy. And why, why would you do that? Well, because you love Jesus Christ more than you love thinking and doing videotapes in your mind of the evil that you'd like to do. You decide that doing those videotapes in your mind and doing those things in your mind is not really what you want to do. You want to follow Christ. Now, how does all that come together? So we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to go through this, and I'm going to read some passages. So I'll be reading for a little while, but when you go through it, just hang in there. Now, this is really important because a lot of guys drift off when this happens. I gave you notes. I'd like you to read along with me. You guys, I've sent the notes to you guys on the uh, Zoom meeting. This is really, really important that you listen and read all the way through. Don't get, you know, halfway through and then disengage, okay? So, you know, you can, you know, take the phone calls later. Now's the time to focus, okay, on God's word. So here we go. James 4, where we're studying, and it's the basis for what we're doing. James 4, 4 through 17 says, you adulterous people, right away, what's he talking about? You and I have a tendency, you know, to wander off. Adulterous people. He's talking to Christians. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity toward against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That's the premise of this entire teaching. So hang in there and listen. Listen to this. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? All through the Bible, from the very beginning, all through the prophets, God wants his people back. He loves them. He doesn't want them to sin. He doesn't want to have to what? Come in and discipline them. He wants them to turn to him. And if they do, he promises to bless them. And that has never changed. It's right here today. 
for all of us. Now listen to what he says here. He says, long as the spirit has caused it well. But he gives us more grace. That means he continually puts up with us doing terribly stupid, sinful things. He continually pours his grace to us. He gives us all the things that we need. Now listen to this. He, prays. he continues to give us grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. What's he talking about? The people who are proud, they keep sinning. You can't touch them. You can't explain it to them. They're pride and they want to do what they want to do. They say they're Christians, but they keep on that path. He says right here, he says, but God favors who? The humble, the people who say, oh my gosh, you come to them, you tell them what they're doing, you tell them what sin they're involved with, and they, they cry and they, they say, pray with me, help me stay away from this. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to have an affair. I don't want to be drinking. I don't want to be, whatever it is you can think about that you may come to a brother and say to him, hey man, you got you to get your act together. Say you're a Christian and look at what you're doing. This, this whole thing about divorces, that's another thing. I talk to people all the time. They give me really good reasons why they ought to get a divorce. I, none of that matters. None of it matters. Everything in there is based on mercy. If you had mercy and grace in your family, and you had the concept and you understood it, there'd be no divorce. And God hates divorce. So what do you think? What do you do? You try to help them and bring them back, and you say to them, listen, if you will humble yourself. Now, what does God always say? My people would humble themselves and come before me? That he would, he would come in, and he'd love them, he'd forgive them, and all the mercy and grace in the world would flow into your life if you would humble yourself before the God, our God, the only God. Now watch what he says here. Submit, verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. So in other words, what do you do now? Now that you have this information, to be a friend with the world is to be an enemy of God. That to walk around and not humble yourself before God, his spirit wants to be one with you, to walk with you. This is Jesus reaching out to you saying, I want to walk with you. I want to be with you. I love you. I want your spirit and my spirit to be one. We need to walk down the path together. And then what he said, so verse 7, what do you do? How do you, how do you bring this together? Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. I just had a conversation with a guy who's right on the verge of, of, of depression. He's got so many. I don't even want to tell you all the stuff he's got. He's got all the things you don't want. He has no family, no wife, so he can't get a divorce. Like some of the guys think that's the answer to everything. I'll just get a divorce. It must be her fault. So he's got no wife to blame everything on. He's got, he's got no health. He totally health is just gone. He's got all these things. He has no money, no job, no net worth, no children. He's got, he just basically got nothing. And he's asking me, help me stay out of despair and, and having these terrible thoughts, you know, and what am I going to do? So wait, what do you think the answer is? What do, think, what do you think the answer is? Here it is. Hold on. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Now listen, here it is. The answer, verse 8. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So what did I do? I made a copy, and I've told you I'm going to share it with you, but I haven't done it yet, of this special prayer that I do every morning with Nancy. Before I do that Psalms prayer, the Psalms I told you in that prayer, where I try to get my heart going with the Psalms and God's word and sort of a rejoicing time, you know, before the Lord, expectation of what he's going to do in my life today. Are you, are you excited about what God is going to do in your life today? Do you, do you wake up in the morning with great expectation thinking, I don't know what it is, but I belong to God and he loves me and he's sovereign and he's got something for me and let's go get him today. What is that the opposite of? Depression. That's hope. The opposite of what? Dread. What does God want his people to do? He wants them to realize that he loves them. Now, this is cool. That he loves them with a love they can't even understand. It is so awesome. Number one. Number two, he's provided for all their sins to be taken away as far as the east is from the west. Number three, he's willing to give you mercy, which means he's not going to treat you like your sins deserve, because he did that to Jesus on the cross. And this is really cool. I mean, he'll, I'm adding it on right now. You want to know, do you want to buy? Let, let me give you this one. He's sovereign. Now, what that means is he has unlimited power, unlimited resources, and he's unlimited love towards you. And he, before eternity passed, dialed everything together so that everything that happens, <clears throat> I walked down here, the guy was blowing the leaves, but I looked over the leaves and leaves were falling down. 
Got some guys who are perverted and weird and don't know what to do with themselves because they just came off of uh, betting on everything in the world. A, 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 um, a leaf will come off the tree. It'll start to float. Watch. And it goes like this. Now, some guys are so perverted. They'll tell you, buddy, okay, I pray. I uh, pray. Yeah, pray. I bet 50 bucks on the dark side on the ground. What's your, you want to take the bet? So what the thing's still floating, going like this. And they're betting on which side that leaf's going to land on, on the ground. Now, those people, you know what they do? You know what's in their heart, deepest part of their heart? You know people like that. You've been like that. Listen carefully. They worship the God of random. In the Bible, it talks about that. And God hates that. He hates it because that's an idol. Another random, because that, listen to me, that goes right into the disbelief that God is sovereign. There isn't a leaf that drops that doesn't hit from this side or that side that isn't in the hand of God from eternity past. You got to get this. You really have to get this. Because you can't really rest in God and feel the love of God when you're being run over by a truck, laying on the concrete, bleeding. Unless you know that from eternity past, he knew, he could have done it, he loves you, he's with you. One of the things that always struck me when I was off running the prodigal thing when I was young, and I was going hard, and, and my brother's sitting right there, it's hard for me to, I can't tell stories here that aren't true and aren't there, at least they got to be real close, because he's sitting right there, and he's not a guy who backs off. And my brother, who's been my little brother for 71 years, just because I happen to be a little older. And the reality is this. I went off the reservation big time, okay? And when I was off the reservation without any detail, I knew that God existed. And I knew he was everywhere. And i that's what made it even worse. And I knew that he loved me. That made it even worse. And I knew that my life was full of mercy and grace, and that made it even worse. And I knew that I was nobody, going no place, but I didn't have to be afraid because somehow, some way, he'd get me through. But I didn't trust him in that sense. Do you understand? I didn't trust him like that. I just knew about him because my parents took me to church, took the word of God, and I saw my dad, and he prayed. I knew it. Do you understand? But I hadn't taken the step to embrace it. But that doesn't mean it wasn't there. Do you understand? Just because I didn't embrace it doesn't mean it wasn't there. And when I came out of that and God and Nancy came and I think I said, oh, my gosh, life's happening. And I, this is, I guess I didn't think it was at a young age, but it was 20 at 20. I just said, Lord, I. I, this is what I, I had a conversation. I said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this. I cannot be away from God. I cannot have come near to you. I have to come near to you, God. And I told, I, it was not a big deal. It wasn't a big emotional thing. It wasn't like now it's more emotional, but then it wasn't emotional. I just, I was that, I was that kind of a guy, man. If I decided it was time to do it, I, that's it. And I told Nancy, I said, well, do you know who Jesus is? All of a sudden, me, I'm, I'm a predator. I'm out there partying. I'm doing all the things I'm doing. There's, I'm, I'm, I wasn't into the drugs or anything, but man, everything else was, you know, okay as long. But I didn't, didn't like that. And I, I, these guys I live with, I just get rid of, get the girls out of the house. I don't want to have this anymore. No more partying. No more this. No more that. And they just couldn't believe. They freaked out. They freaked out. And I turned to Nancy. I said, "You know who Jesus is?" She goes, "Jesus." I said, yeah, do you know who Jesus is? Because we're going we're gonna to get married. And everything about us needs to be about Jesus. Because see, back then, Eric, I had the exact premise of what First Love Ministries is all about. First love is Jesus Christ. My first love has to go from being the world, doing everything I wanted to do, Focused on Jesus. And then Nancy, if I'm going to marry Nancy, she needs to know who Jesus is. So while I was a little girl, we used to sing songs. And I went to Sunday school in times. And I said, well, we, we're going to get to know Jesus. 
we're going to go find us a church. We got out the first time. We were just driving around. Back then, everybody, you know, smoking a cigarette, driving around in the car, looking from church to church, walking in, doing this and doing that. And all of a sudden, we realized this wasn't, you know, walked into a church. And I came from a Bible church, you know, out in the desert. You know, I walked to this church. We sat there for a while. We listened. I'm, I was there 10 minutes. I did. This isn't it. Went down to the next street, went down to another church, did the whole thing. Listened for about 20 minutes. Uh, this isn't it either. Went down another church. Serious, another church. This is in Alhambra, that whole area. I went to another church. I'm sure wonderful people, but I knew. I could tell. I could smell it, you see, because I'd been dealing with God for a long time. I could feel the spirit of God one way there. So I got into another word. That wasn't it. I said, I got real frustrated. We went back, sat down at McDonald's, you know, had a cup of coffee, did whatever. I said, okay, next week, I said, we got to find a Baptist church. And I didn't want to find a Baptist church. We never went to a Baptist church, but I knew for sure because I sort of knew about the Baptist thing. We go to a Baptist church, they're going to teach the Bible. So the next week, we went to this Baptist church, met this guy, Dr. I forget his name now, what a great guy. And uh, within a week, I asked Nancy, they said, you know, that you stand up and go down, you walk down the aisle, right? And I said to Nancy, about two weeks down the road, we're sitting there. I said, Nancy, I didn't say, do you want to draw near to God? Come near to God and he'll come near to you. But I did say, do you want to go down? The front? I'll walk with you if you want to go down and accept Christ. And she said, yes. And we both walked down the thing together and we were up there and uh, Do Riley, Dr. Riley, great guy. So he, he gets to know us and we're living in a little apartment. I'm working at Trader Joe's. And if you're uh, back then, if you're a Baptist, you're not allowed to work in a liquor store or whatever. But I worked at the first Trader Joe's, one of the first ones. And uh, learning how to sell wine and all the different things. And, and he was so great. Young couple, he didn't, you know, brought us in. Two weeks later, we were right up there in a dunking pool. We were getting baptized right up there in front of everybody, you know. And it was so great. We got baptized together. That was 52 years ago, right? Right? 52 years ago. Now, now this is important. So what we did was we're not holy rollers. I just started reading the Bible. It, it was like this. My boat was going this way, and we turned around, and we went that way. Now, which way did we go? Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So we did exactly what First Love Ministries is all about. We made our first love who? Jesus Christ. So that every decision that we made as a family from that point on included Jesus Christ. It didn't mean we didn't make our own decisions, wrong decisions, sinful decisions. It just meant... That in the process of making and doing everything we did, Jesus Christ was part of it. Because you know what was the most important thing when I was 20 years old? Where I was going to be in 10,000 years? Because I knew there was a difference between this way and that way. So where was I going to be in 10,000 years? You want to help your kids come to know the Lord? They won't read their Bible. They won't go to church. They won't come to the men's group. You just mention to them every once in a while. Do you know where you're going to be in 10,000 years? A lot of people used to say, well, if you died tomorrow, do you, would you go to heaven or where would you go? And it, it doesn't quite work. In the, like It may work, I'm not saying. But for me personally, where are you going to be in 10,000 years in Jesus Christ? I said, that's, that's, it's not religion. It's just that's it. That's what's important to me. It's called first love. What's your first love? My first love, almost all the time, I'm constantly in contact, conflict with it. You know what my first love is? Me. I love me. I want more of me. I want what I want. I want to do what I want to do. I want to eat. Well, you guys go out to dinner with me at lunch. You know, I, I'm very particular. I want it this way or that way or this way or that way. Now, I, because I'd rather not eat if it didn't come the right way, if it wasn't the thing. So if it's not going to come that way, I don't want to eat it. Who cares? I don't have to eat. I'm, you know, I'm like 12 pounds overweight. I could not eat at all. The point, if it doesn't taste good, why bother eating it when you're, you know, you're overweight, right? Now, if you're really destitute and you're underweight and everything, just eat whatever they give you. It doesn't matter. But the point is this. Listen, all I think about most of the time is me. What do you think about? Oh, I know. You're thinking about this, that, and the other. So the Lord has got First Love Ministries USA doing what? Thinking about other people. So I spend a lot of time thinking about orphans and widows. Where did that come from? I'm a selfish guy. I just want to play golf and make sure they have my food just the way I like it. Well, guess what? A whole bunch of my time is doing stuff. We had a meeting the other day with this guy about raising the funds we need at the end of the year. We need a, a big chunk of change. 
And he said, well, you start, probably have to make some phone calls and do this and do that. I don't want to make phone calls. I don't make phone calls. I don't call people on the phone and say, hey, man, uh, you know, send us some money, you know, that kind of thing. That's not what we do. And, and the guy said, well, you, you know, that's how other people do it. And I said, yeah, I know. We haven't done it. We just send an email. And he said, well, how many people you think are reading the emails? And I said, my gosh, you know, it's not. we have a little thing that tells who opens them up. And we were not really doing good on that. And then how many people you think open them up, actually read them, and then pray about it and whatever? He said, I don't know. And the answer is what? I have to trust God and let him. I have to start thinking about those things. And I have to do what? Oh, I didn't want to hear this. But I have to do what God has put me in place to do, which is to ask and you shall receive, right? Ask and you shall receive. I'd rather not ask and then receive anyway. How's that one? Don't ask and receive. I think that works for me. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what God said. You know why? Because when you ask, what happens? What does it say? You have to humble yourself. You become the guy you never wanted to become. You become the kind of guy that the world looks down upon. And the answer is, am I going to be a friend of the world? Now listen carefully. Or am I going to be a friend of who? Of God. Am I going to be in the world, but not of the world? Am I going to make my decisions based on what the world does or what on what? On what God tells me. So let's read a little bit more here. It says, submit yourselves into God, resist the devil. Now, what does that mean, resist the devil? It means resist the devil. You know what it means. He's in control of what? The darkness, the, the, the logic of spiritual darkness that is our world. You have to resist that. I'll give you a good example. you got to resist what? Critical race theory. You have to resist uh, the 1619 Project. You have to resist the, the foolishness of the hoax of the uh, January 6th insurgency uh, you know, propaganda. You, you have to resist those things in your country that are just plain evil. Marxism is evil. Okay? Communism is evil. You know that. As a Christian, you resist the devil. You resist the evil that's out there around you all the time. You resist transgenderism, gender neutralism. You resist gay marriage. All these things are you resist murder, murder in our streets. They're, they're, what are the number of murders in Chicago every 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 week? It's just unbelievable. You resist that. Why? Because that is the evil one. He's out there doing his evil things. And if no one stands up, if there's no light and salt, we say, but if I stand up light and salt, somebody will kill me. Somebody will take my position away. I won't look good. What's going to happen? And the answer is, they very well may shoot you. They very well, well may cause you your job. It may cause you your business or cause you, for me, it causes deals. You know, Inside of you, there is a battle going on so that you can either what? Resist God, right? Or resist the devil. And you can either accept God and seek God when he can be found or not. Because this isn't in the Bible. He can be found. He can be found. He can be found. And one day, if you don't turn your heart to God, that's it. You're hardened and you'll never come to Christ. And what God says, look at, I'm going to read it again because I can't go by. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Did you hear what it said? Double-minded. He's talking about people, say they're Christians, but they're double-minded. They're constantly going back and forth between this, that, and the other one. Should I drink a little more? Should I not drink? Should I have an affair? Should I not have an affair? Should I do this or I do that? Everything is it. Now listen carefully what it says here. It says, come near to God and he'll come near. Oh, here, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning. And I love this part because it really talks about what you and I have to do. Our joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. This is really critical. We're not to judge each other because everybody's a sinner. We're all out there. Don't judge anybody, whether they're a Christian or not. Just tell them about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about your walk. And well, here it goes. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. In other words, who are you? God gave the law. Now listen to what it says. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. In other words, you're acting like you're God. Okay? There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. That's God. So in other words, he's there. He can save or destroy. But you... Who are you to judge your neighbor? Listen, I told you that about two weeks ago, we talked about that. When you see people that aren't Christians, 
You pray for them and love them. That's why it says love your enemies. Why? Because you're not judging them. You don't have the right. You need to have mercy and grace on them. You have no idea what God's doing in their lives. God's working. He's sovereign. And he wants you to be salt and light. He does not want you to make judgment. Oh, that guy's lost. He'll never come to the Lord and whatever. I've had that. You know, my life has been full of those kinds of surprises. The most amazing things God does in people's lives. When you think there's just absolutely no way. You and I are not to judge somebody else's salvation. Now, we have to judge people in making decisions of what we do, who we hang out with, who we allow, you know, who we marry, you know, that kind of thing, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you make those, you make those judgments. But this is judgments unto salvation. In other words, we have to be very careful and love everybody to Christ, okay? That word comes back to that thing I always talk about. It's not all, you remember what he's talking about. Salvation has to do with who you are in Christ the Holy Spirit working through you then does the works. Do you hear me? Who you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit then works through you. It's the fruits of the Spirit. Now, here's the problem. Many people think if I want to be a Christian, I go to church and I do a bunch of good stuff, and then I'm a Christian. And Jesus keeps saying, no, no, don't do that, because you'll not come to heaven. He says, I want to be you, you and I to be together, and hear it back. We're back to what? First Love Ministries USA. What is it that we're all about? First love. Who is your first love? And what do we always say? Where are you going to be in 10,000 years? In Jesus Christ. That's the deal. And you say, well, how do I find out? What do I do? Open your Bible. Read your Bible. That's God's word. It tells all about Jesus. It tells you everything you need to know. And now, instead of judging somebody, get this, instead of judging somebody, you just, you're just offering them an opportunity to look at who Jesus Christ is and where you're going to be in 10,000 years. Here's the word of God. And, and I'd be happy to help you with it or whatever. Here's some notes from our Bible study. Hey, why don't you come on Wednesday morning sometime? You know, and you get an idea of what we're doing. You see, the biggest advantage of this group is there's no fall to all. And we're not here sitting down. You got to tell everybody your life story and you got to pray over in the corner. You got to do this. You just come here. We talk about the word of God. We talk about how difficult life is. We talk about how we need each other's help. We talk about the reality that God is sovereign and he loves us. We talk about the reality that we're, we're looking forward to being with, with our Lord and he's coming any minute. We know that, but at any minute could be in 2000 years. And so that means you and I are going to be there any minute, any minute, any minute. There's a Psalm that I read and pray every morning. It says, Lord teach us to know how brief our life is. I mean, we are just here for a little while. And what that means is God's coming. He's coming really soon. And when I take my last breath, he's coming. It could be tomorrow morning. And the answer is that you and I need to be ready. So what? He, let's read this. Verse 13. Now listen, you who say today, I love this. This is so cool. I'm in business. You're in business. Listen to what it says. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. You, you, everything's before God. He's sovereign. You got to get that. You're not in charge of anything. You have to ask God about your plans, about your business, about everything. Now watch what he says. He says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? I'll bet you right now, if I asked you guys, what's your schedule for tomorrow? I've been trying to get the lunch with some guys, you know, like trying to Kevin get the lunch or whatever. We got scheduled, right? Try to hit. How do we hit the schedule? And we all have these schedules. We know where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing over there. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. You don't. You may be driving to the office and you got, I've had this happen before. You're driving to the office and you got three meetings in a row. People are coming in from out of town. They're flying in. The guy's going to be there at 930. Another guy, you got another meeting at 1130. And then you got a late lunch at 130 and you got boom, boom, boom. And they're all lined up and they all know because they're all part of the same deal and they want to make the deals go right. And everything's fine. I'm driving down the road. What happens? Somebody runs into me. My car breaks down. My wife calls me and says, one of the kids has been injured. You got to get to the hospital. Guess what? I have no idea what I'm going to do any day. I could have sworn I was going to be in those meetings. I never got to those meetings. Got it? Never got there. And what I'm trying to say to you is this. Every day you wake up, and you pray, and you put your life in the hands of the almighty God, loving Father, creator, and the Lord Jesus, and you say, Lord, let your will be done today, not my will. 
Lord, I'm excited about what you have planned for me today. I'm excited because I know you're sovereign. I'm excited because I know that I belong to you and that you love me and you're going to work in my life today. And Lord, I'm excited because I really don't know what's going to happen today. I think I know what's going to happen pretty close, but I don't know. That's what makes golfers really cool. If, if I went based on what I've done the last three times I played golf, I would never play golf again. <laughs> Ever. There'd be, there'd be absolutely no reason. I didn't feel when I got off my leg hurt, my back started, it was tight. I didn't make any putt, not one putt, not a three foot putt. I made zero putts. I hit the ball and skidded it along the ground. I did not get the ball in the air. I just couldn't do anything. It's because, and I, because I can't hit on range because of my back. Man, yeah, it's all kinds of reasons. But the point is, you, you know, at my age, I know many guys just, if, it, you know, if you play at a certain level and then you start playing at a certain level, you just quit. You know why you quit? I'll tell you why. Because <clears throat> you have no hope. You, you just, you don't, but now when I, I, I don't know, I'm a weirdo. I get on the first tee and I see myself hitting the ball right over there. I actually have a place. I have a, I have a place. I have a place right over there. And then I see myself hitting a one or two different irons right over there on the green. And then I see myself rolling in a nice 15 footer right in for birdie. I just see it. I trust it. I'm driving down the road, going somewhere else, not going to play golf for a week. I still can see it. I still think it's going to happen. That's called expectation. I have hope. I know. What kind of expectations do you have? Joe, you got those things are going to, you know, you're going to sell those houses. They're going to get sold. You're going to do the deal. Gene, you got so many things going on. I have no idea what you could expect, but whatever it is, you could expect, right? Kevin, all the complications of all that stuff. What do you expect? I'll tell you what you expect. I know you guys, I know you well enough to know. You know what you expect? That God's hand is in everything all the time. Talk about, oh, expectations. I got grandkids. And that complicates things greatly. My daughter, it's her birthday today, just turned, I won't tell you. But I remember many years ago, we walked out of the hospital with this little bundle in my arms. And a little reddish hair, auburn, squiggling around. Little hot bodied, you know, little baby. That little one. It's now a woman who owns, and has a husband and she has three girls that are big girls now, you know, 15, 13, and seven. And, and but what's going to happen with them? And all of a sudden you start worrying about them. Where are they going to be? What's going to happen there? Is, that my, are they at school? Did they, not, did they get picked up? Did they have a cold? What happened? Are they over there? You know, oh, they're going to go to a party. 15-year-old girl that looks like that's going to go to a party. <laughs> oh, no way. You know, what's going on? And, you know, I'm not in charge of that. They're going to start driving, start driving, driving. Can you believe that? Just even practice driving to me freaks me out. I remember what it was when I had to teach my daughter, you know. So all I'm asking you to do is to think about this. We can plan and we can look forward to things only because, because it's foolishness. If God doesn't love us, and God's not there, and he's not sovereign, then everything's based on random. Remember? The God of random. And most people live their lives. Is this? And I, I hate to say this, and we're going to close with it. Most Christians are living their lives as though they're, they're worshiping the God of random. Because they are just saying, well, may, may not happen, this, that, and the other thing. Oh, I hate this word. I hate this word. Oh, you're so lucky. Or some guy has this blessing that he's had, and all these says, I was the luckiest. I, I, you know, I've been so lucky. And all. Listen, man, here's the deal. God blessed you. God sovereign. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to give him glory and honor? Or are you going to think of yourself and just go right on to hell and leave all this for people you don't even know what they're going to do with it? So what are you going to do? And the answer is, whenever you're talking to people like that, and I talk to those people, without getting into a big argument with him, because I've, I've gotten deep in the, in the weeds on quote-unquote religion, and I found that there's no way to do that. You want to just get them to think about one thing, and that is where you're going to be in 10,000 years. That always gets their attention. Because nobody, somebody says, why don't you do 100 years? No, I don't want to do 100 years. I want to do 10,000. You know why? I want to move it way beyond their capability of understanding time. 
Where are you going to be in 10,000 years in Jesus Christ? You figure that out, put it together. I'll see you later. And if you want to know more, ask me next time we get together. Leave that little bombshell in their heart and in their mind. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will bring them to God. It's your job. Now, listen to me. It's your job to bring them your first love. What is your first love? You, know, you ought to be thinking about that. You might want to write, sit down and write down all the things that indicate what your first love is. Okay, where do you spend your time? Do you know how hard it is for you guys to get here? I know how hard it was for me to get here this morning. And I know if I talked to all you guys, it'd be very difficult. You know how hard it is? You don't get here unless you want to be here. Okay, because your first love is this is a place where you contact and you come in contact with the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean this is the only place. It just means it's one place. And it doesn't mean that it's just a place where we do it. Us, we do it, the guys that are here. And the answer is, what is your first love? Because that's how you make your decisions. So here it is. Let's read it and we'll leave and we'll stop. Because why do you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Your life is short. Instead, you ought to say, if it is God's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do. Oh, boy. Lord. If anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, then it's sin for them. So in other words, if you know that the Lord's leading you to do something, and you know that you've been living for yourself, and you know that you haven't really made him number one, and he comes to you and says, you know, you ought to do this, and you don't do it, that's sinful. A lot of people say, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. But did you do anything right? Did you do what God wanted you to do? I remember I used to have that problem when people were in the hospital, and I was doing this, and I was praying for them, and, and whatever, and, and I was driving along, and the Lord said, Don, you're going to hit golf balls, or you're going to go to the hospital? Well, Gene's going to be okay. Who cares? You know, his wife's talking, the whole thing, who cares? I come rocking in to see Gene. He says, you don't have to be here, Don. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. And I'm looking, they got a drip thing over here and everything. He's about ready to die. His arm's all, you know, screwed up. I said, I, mean, I came over here to pray for you. And you're sitting over here and they're all afraid. They don't want you out of the hospital because they don't want you to die. So I think we ought to pray. And, and Gene says, yeah, yeah. This, I love Gene. This is what he said. Yeah, I, I guess we should. That's how, that's how, isn't that Gene? That's what he said. Yeah, I guess we should. And so we do. And Joy, I walk and see Joy coming down the line. And your wife, remembering all the things that happened. And I see him down the hallway. He sees me. And his son, Joey, jumps in the middle and comes over and gives me a big hug. You know, I haven't seen him. He used to come here, but I haven't seen him in a long time. You know why? Because it was time. It was time. It was time for us to do what we knew was right. What, when's your time to do what, what you know? If Jesus Christ is your first love, then what is it that you're not doing you're supposed to be doing? Because that is simple. Because that's what God wants us to do, is to listen to the Spirit and respond to the Spirit. He doesn't want you running off and doing things so that you look good. He doesn't want you doing things that makes you look like a, a really super Christian. He says to those people, away from me, I never knew. And they said, whoa, we're super Christians. Lord, Lord, we called you Lord. We did all these things. And Jesus said, I never knew you. That's mean there was no Jesus in them. Is there Jesus in you? Because if there is, now listen carefully, if Christ is in you, he is the hope of glory. There's your 10,000 years where you're going to be. If it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that means it's not dread. You don't dread dying and you don't dread going out and working hard and you don't dread having to make difficult decisions. You don't dread loving people who don't deserve. This is a big one. You don't dread loving people who don't deserve it. You don't dread giving mercy and grace. You look forward to it. You know, they, this one guy said something, and believe me, I said it way before he did, but don't waste, don't waste some terribly difficult, tragic situation. Don't waste some problem in your life. It's a great opportunity for you to trust God. And by doing that, by giving mercy and grace, God blesses you. Lord Jesus, thank you for the message. Oh, Lord, we come to you with great expectation today. We have hope in you, for it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's, it's nothing else. It's always you. You are our first love. We pray and thank you for being with us today. 
Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, Lord Jesus. Thank you for raising from the dead. You defeated the power of sin and death in our lives. And you made us born again children of the living God. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We're so thankful. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, guys.